Well, welcome everyone. So really looking forward to the panel discussion that we have for you today. I hope you will enjoy it as much as myself. So today we have a great lineup of panelists. So we have uh, Azita Arvani from Rakuten. We have Kashta Joshi KJ is from AT&T and Don Tercel from Google. So thanks everyone for attending and being available today. So quickly what we're gonna do is just go over a little bit of the background of the benefits of disaggregation and how that has changed uh, 5G for both cloud and uh, for mobile RAN. Uh, some of the challenges facing uh, the service providers and then we'll get into a panel discussion where, where each uh, panelist will be presenting for approximately 10 minutes. Then we'll close up with some questions and answers. So for people who are not aware of the developments, traditional RAN equipment would have been largely proprietary equipment. With virtualization, there's an opportunity to do disaggregation, so to use of commercial off-the-shelf servers and other hardware that's not uh, necessarily proprietary. I think we've seen in 2021, the key advantage is if you can have multiple providers in a, a marketplace like this, that's certainly an advantage. So there, there's multiple other advantages as well, but uh, certainly timely for, for our market today. So when putting these things together for the, the abstract at the beginning, you know, I think a time to market, uh, sustainability, flexibility, you know, all the rules I would say over the last 18 months or so have just changed so radically. So time to market, you know, really the keys today are availability of components and being able to get into the marketplace. So some of the things that are uh, general for getting any successful product out to the field, I think there's some particular challenges that have come up in the, the last 18 months. So I think if you have an open solution, these are gonna be things that are gonna be very helpful to companies. So with that, then we'll have uh, Azita to start off. Great, uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you about uh, what we're doing at Rocketen. Um, I want to start by saying that the title of this talk for, for us, Disruption as a Service, is not a pompous uh, title. It really comes uh, from a place of humility because a few years ago we decided to become a mobile network operator. And uh, since we were going to be the fourth mobile network operator in Japan uh, in a fully saturated mobile market, uh, in, 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 in the COVID phase with, it would come up, we decided that you know the best way that you could take an edge, have an edge, How's this? Okay, very good. <laughs> so hopefully you heard the first part of it, so I won't repeat it. But anyways, um, we decided to become a mobile network operator. Rocketen is a uh, internet services company. We have over 70 different businesses. Uh, and the reason why it's relevant to what we're talking about here is that disruption in most of the industries comes from adjacent markets, not from the market itself. So when we decided to become a mobile network operator, uh, we decided that it has to live in the cloud. It has to be according to open standards. And that's not really what the traditional model is. And as Jim showed the picture to you, so we decided to, to go all in. Now, before that in the industry, so if you go to the next slide, uh, before that in the industry, there was... Okay. All right. Okay, <laughs> uh, so, no problem, third time is a charm. Um, before that in the industry, you know, in October of 2012, um, there was this network function virtualization and software defined networking paper that came out that AT&T and a number of other uh, operators and, and, and vendors had authored. So we, we knew that uh, cloudification is coming to telco like it's been coming to any other industry, but it's been really hard for for people to take it 
uh, beyond a proof of concept and beyond a trial. So what we did is that we got uh, Spectrum in early uh, 2018. We worked with a number of uh, innovative uh, startups um, and we uh, launched the first uh, commercial end-to-end -end cloud native open RAN network in Japan um, in, in 4G in April of last year in 2020. And because of all the cost savings that we were getting from that and the agility that we had and the security that we had, we were able to pass those cost savings to our consumers. So we have a service plan that's uh, half the price of the uh, what the that kind of service plan goes for in in Japan. And uh, we even in a COVID day, we went to a, um, f a million users within a, a couple of months. And now uh, a year and a half later, we're at over five million uh, subscribers and. Um, so we launched our 5G service in uh, September of last year, and uh, now we're getting ready for 5G SA and uh, launching that. Um, if we go to the next uh, slide, so the, the strategic innovation pillars for us, number one is disaggregation in radio, and there are uh, three layers of disaggregation that we look at. Uh, one is going from this um, monolithic vertical stack to open RAN, as we all call it, open radio access network. That basically means that we've taken this vertical stack, we move it into uh, three units, uh, the RU, the, the distributed unit, and, uh, and the centralized unit. And um, the interfaces between these uh, parts are standardized and defined by ORAN Alliance. Uh, so that's one level of aggregation, uh, disaggregation. The next level of disaggregation comes when you go from purpose-built hardware and software to having cloud-native software running on top of COTS hardware, and that's what uh, this, this group is all about. So uh, that has greatly reduced our capex, as you can imagine. And then the third layer of uh, disaggregation in RAN for us is to look at the radio unit as its own uh, white box and really go inside the box and see how we can reduce the the pricing uh, and optimizing uh, that, that box. So for example, for the 28 gigahertz millimeter wave, uh, the base station that we have is uh, the, the price of an enterprise Wi-Fi access point, so by, by redesigning it. Um, so the next one is the unified cloud. We have a cloud that goes across all of our tiers of uh, data center from the centralized cloud to regional cloud to far edge. Uh, massive automation, we uh, believe in uh, relentless automation end-to-end -end because one of the reasons for that is the constraint that we had that we didn't have the deep pockets to be able to have you know, uh, thousands of um, field technicians around uh, tending to various uh, uh, you know, hardware and upgrades and all that. So we made sure that um, we take advantage of automation and then the organization obviously has to be skilled and um, think of platform and systems rather than being experts in silos. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what our network looks like uh, in Japan. There are three um, tiers of, uh, of the, the cloud here. You see the on the very left-hand side uh, near the base station, that's where the uh, far edge uh, cloud sits. We, so we have thousands of those. And then we have the regional data centers where the less real-time uh, part of the uh, system resides, like the centralized unit or um, parts of the core. Uh, and then in the centralized uh, data center, which we have a few of those, and that's where the packet core uh, uh, and the, the very <laughs> least real-time part of the system resides. So this now is based on open RAN architecture, as I talked to you about. Uh, before, uh, the standards costs that I mentioned to you, these are all uh, x86 servers. And even at that, we've reduced the number of servers to just two models, uh, one that can handle the, the, the DU workloads, and then the other one that handles all the other workloads. Um, and then the multi-edge, multi-access edge computing uh, is also supported in this. And, um, and automation that we talked about. Again, for sake of time, <laughs> move on to the next one. Um, a lot of people talk about 
this Cloudify telco and open RAN is good for cost optimization, but it may not be good for performance optimization. And we are uh, proving that that's not the case with you know, uh, third party independent measurements. So for example, Umlaut came in and measured our performance against all the other urban cities around the world, like uh, Tokyo, uh, our service versus others. And we ranked in uh, beyond very good and just shy of outstanding. So that's our 4G service. And if you go to the next one, uh, just last month, um, Open Signal uh, published a report uh, for our 5G performance. So even on 5G, we have the best upload and download speeds in Japan, uh, which is a big deal because we are a, a very young network, only a year and a half old, uh, and we are doing better than uh, all the other three incumbents that are using traditional uh, networks. And also we're top 10 in the world. Um, if you go to the next slide, so now the second chapter of our uh, existence in terms of the mobile initiative is to say, okay, so we've done that in Japan, we've proven that this model works, and how do we help others to be able to do the same thing? So we've taken the platform that powers our uh, Japan network and offering it to other people around the world, uh, to other operators, governments, enterprises. So with that, um, our stack is a five-layer stack. So at the bottom is the unified uh, cloud that I mentioned before that's sitting on top of those two uh, models of IT servers, and they support both uh, radio workloads and telco workloads as well as the IT workloads, and it's uh, running uh, Kubernetes uh, and containerized workloads. So, and then on top of that is the network functions, and so this is where the virtualized RAN, virtualized core, and other edge applications come in. We have intelligent operations where it operationalizes all of this and uh, orchestrates all these services and uh, makes sure that um, we cross-correlate the data so then the entire set of network functions that could come from different vendors are acting like a holistic system rather than just product uh, point solutions stitched together. And then on top of that, we have a marketplace. So our idea is that eventually people will, even telcos will be able to buy things uh, like they would buy things from an app store, right? Uh, so that's the marketplace. And then beyond that, something that telcos have been talking about forever is this notion of service agility. How do we bring over the top services to, the, to, to this platform easily? And for us, it's a second nature because we have, uh, as I mentioned, tons of uh, internet services ourselves, and we also want to uh, bring third-party services on top of that, too. So then, um, yes, uh, we uh, believe in openness, and we believe that if you're open, then the, the best way to stay ahead is by continuously disrupt. So we work with a lot of different open source communities. We are uh, on the board of Oran Alliance. In addition to that, we're also on the board of uh, Open Round Policy Coalition because uh, this is a new ecosystem, so uh, governments and others also need to help to uh, move it forward. And we have our labs in various uh, parts of the world. And, yet, and then the last one here is to show that, uh, so right now what we, are, we have proved is that this thing works. We have it running um, with you know, over 30,000 macro base stations, you know, 50,000 uh, uh, small cells and various, so it's a massive scale in Japan. We have one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one in Germany who has asked us to uh, build and, and um, plan, build, and, and operate the network for them based on our architecture. We are also working with DISH here in the US. So those are in terms of the greenfield operators, the brownfield operators, uh, Telefonica, Etisalat, STC, they're all interested in, in Open RAN as well. And uh, we're also working with the majority of other operators too. So this is where you can see a lot of the work that, the, that you're involved in is actually coming to the market and, and scaling up. So thank you. Great, thank you, Azita. I'll, I'll do that for you. Okay. So next up we have KJ, so I don't hey, Thank you, Jim. Are, is everyone able to hear me? Okay, great. So thanks, thanks, Azita. Thanks, Jim. It's a real pleasure and honor to come and share 
AT&T's views on uh, VRAM with you today. Um, if you go to the next slide. So AT&T is not new to virtual network virtualization. As I think Azita pointed out, uh, we've been part of this uh, network virtualization story right from day one. And uh, AT&T has had some of the most aggressive targets in the industry in terms of virtualizing our network. In fact, just last year, we completed a, a self-imposed goal of virtualizing to 75% of our uh, network. So it's no surprise that um, we are interested in VRAN, we think RAN is next, and that's where a lot of investment is for AT&T or any telcos. Uh, we believe that it's an opportunity that is, um, uh, that is right, right? But there's also a few other aspects, uh, especially for a company like AT&T to keep in mind. So I think it would be fair to say we have a fairly large network. Um, we have 100 million plus users, uh, 250 million plus um, uh, uh, people are covered by our 5G service. And we have very aggressive um, roadmap in terms of deploying new spectrum. We are deploying C-band uh, over the next two, three years uh, with a goal of hitting um, 70 million plus folks next year and then uh, on to 200 million the year after that. So the question is not if we ran, the question is how and when, right? Because when we look at VRAN, we look at it from that context. It's like we are very proud of our network. We spend a lot of time and energy making sure that the network is as performant, as reliable for our users and customers as we can possibly make it. And when we introduce VRAN into it, we want to make sure that it's a seamless experience for end customers. Right? So one message for us is that it's still early days for VRAN. I think if you're a greenfield operator, it's very clear. Um, what path you should be on and how you should start. When you're a brownfield operator, I think there are a few things that we have to keep in mind. Right? So th that's when things like what spectrum are you on starts becoming important. So we see a lot of VRAN solutions out there. Um, on the FDD side, that's where the low bands are. Uh, software is very stable, things work very well. A lot of the early deployments have been on those bands. When we start moving to mid bands, TDD, I think that's where uh, the software is still maturing, and um, uh, features are, uh, in some sense, um, uh, going to be coming, rolling in over the next couple of years. Um, the, uh, so in order to make sure that we are um, taking cognizance of that, I mean, AT&T has been uh, doing a lot of work on VRAN. We've made some very early announcements. Uh, for example, we've done trials uh, uh, with Nokia that we've talked about. Uh, I think we are comfortable with the performance of VRAN. Um, we've recently made announcements uh, partnering with uh, Microsoft, although that's more on the core side. Uh, we, we talked to them about VRAN as well. Uh, there's been other announcements uh, about partnerships with companies like Intel. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes. And there'll be a lot more announcements to come. Um, so what have we learned? I mean, this is the OCP um, uh, summit, so I wanted to come in, share some uh, thoughts from where we think uh, technology has matured, what we like, where are some of the gaps, and point out some areas where the OCP community um, may be interested in working in and uh, drive solutions that will make their way into uh, VRAN roadmaps. So in terms of what's fantastic, I think uh, the hardware diversity the silicon diversity that comes with moving to uh, RAN virtualization is simply fantastic. Uh, we are at a point where we have so many vendors who are doing accelerators, which are kind of important on the RAN because you do need to, uh, them to maintain performance on the uh, distributed unit. Uh, there are many uh, vendors who are building silicon accelerators. There are uh, options available for chipsets, for, um, uh, you know, there are options available for NIC cards, there are options available for switching. And that's a lot of choice that operators have never had before. So you get a lot of uh, flexibility in how you dimension things. How do you right size stuff? How, how do you take advantage of where your workloads are gonna be heavy and dimension your system for that versus optimizing your investment so that you get the maximum performance out of your network, right? But also, um, you get more deployment flexibility and uh, the ability to 
um, uh, you know, mix and match workloads, and then also take leverage of all the cloud automation that is happening in telcos at the higher layers of the stack. Right? Many telcos, in fact, all, you know, most of them have invested in the cloud in the higher layers of the stack. They're building expertise on automation. And then we would love to take advantage of some of that uh, automation and bring it down to the area where most of our in investment is. Now, that said, not everything is you know, a bed of roses. As with any new technology, there's going to be hiccups, and VRAN is no different. Uh, in some of the areas where we see uh, challenges that the industry will work out are around that area of brownfield, as I said. Uh, the software roadmaps are still evolving. Uh, there are some vendors uh, for RAN who were kind of born in, born in the cloud, right? So born virtualized. But there are other vendors who are legacy vendors. Now they're moving into VRAN. Uh, they have new roadmaps for software. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, it takes a while for the new software to catch up with all the features that are there in um, the legacy RAN that have been uh, developed over years of uh, development and um, work. Right, so that, that is an area where I think some uh, more work uh, will be needed. Um, management is another um, aspect. Uh, we have now with VRAN, we are going from sort of a two-stack lifecycle management problem, the hardware and the software, to a three-stack lifecycle management problem. You know, that's the hardware, the cloud layer, and the software. That takes us a while for uh, telcos to restructure and retool around. And, uh, we, you know, the telcos have to be careful not to disrupt service, not to create uh, a bad customer experience while they do all of that. And then, as with any kind of disaggregation, and OCP community is not, uh, um, uh, you, you know, it's not new to the OCP community, but as, as with any kind of disaggregation, uh, integration, interoperability testing, and making sure that uh, when you have components coming from different players, they're going to work uh, and with some accountability. I think that's always uh, the key, right? So those are areas where I think um, uh, the open source community can also help. Uh, OCP has uh, done work in, uh, has addressed some of these uh, challenges before. Um, and also, I, I, you know, I, I'd like to point out that there are some interesting new challenges with VRAN. Uh, so as all of this hardware is evolving, and you know, we are also very cognizant of the fact that the RAN is different in one critical aspect, which is its level of distribution, right? I mean, just pulling out uh, statistics, uh, uh, publicly available statistics, there are over 400,000 cell sites in the US alone. There are over 25,000 COs, which can be potential CRAN hubs, right? And when you're deploying a, effectively a cloud infrastructure at those many locations, uh, there are some aspects that uh, you have to be aware of. For example, as the hardware evolves, uh, and operators deploy this hardware, you know, we don't want to be in a position where uh, we're stuck with you know, hardware from three years ago because that's what all of our tooling and infrastructure is uh, uh, designed for. You know, we want to be able to keep using bleeding edge hardware every year as new spectrum gets deployed and make sure that all the surround for that is consistent and stable, right? And that's especially true of the software layer. You know, we don't want to, there to be a version B for hardware B and a version A for hardware A, and then have feature disparities in, in, in all of those. So I, I think these are all um, things to keep in mind as the industry goes through the transformation. And, and so I'll just, I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but just to say that uh, at and is a big supporter of open source, open standards especially. Uh, we are participating in many industry forums. We are driving work in some of them. I've pointed out some of them here, uh, particularly germane to uh, open um, RAN uh, servers. You know, there's the ORAN Alliance where we were one of the founding members. We are driving work on hardware accelerator abstraction layers there. Uh, there's Redfish, the work uh, Redfish is doing and uh, in order to get uh, a consistent uh, um, uh, you know, BMS uh, interface. And then we've also done trials with OpenEdge as well in uh, part of the work that we've done with, uh, with OpenRAN. And, and we do think that operators that want a sled-based kind of design uh, will uh, inev inevitably need to go into a open source form factor uh, and have interoperability for the reasons which I mentioned earlier. And so with that, I'll uh, hand it back to Jim. Thanks, TJ. So last but certainly not least, Don Tercel from Google. 
Thanks very much, everyone. I may block you out because I don't have my glasses and I have to. And, and I'm a fairly large human being, so. Do you want to take it? Um, no, I can get it. Okay. So those of you that don't know Google Cloud, I've been there. And this is almost my fifth year. Telco is a fairly new space for us. Um, I'm one of the original members of the telco team, and I'm working on most of the large partnerships with both carriers and providers like Rakuten, and also the software companies that are adopting VRAN on our platforms for delivery to carriers. So I support all the teams out there that are selling open systems and open solutions to carriers. Next slide. You can just click through, Jim. It's a bit of an eye chart, but we announced our strategy in March of 2020. We were going to come out at MWC with a big splash in Spain. I had my tickets. All went down in flames. Um, but we have forged ahead um, as the fastest growing cloud provider, I think, putting the partnerships in place to be successful in building 5G networks and integrating with 4G and 3G networks is really what our vision is. Um, we've announced several partnerships on that slide is our partnership with Ericsson, Nokia, Casa Systems. We have a whole network of partnerships of both RAN providers, both open and proprietary. Um, we're working closely with our, our friends at AT&T on their edge initiatives. So we see this as bifurcated opportunity in the market which is carriers want to talk about how do they modernize their commercial network, but how do they modernize their edge network so they can deliver on the monetization that they have to justify to the board to invest in 5G. So all these industry use cases are going to require a RAN private wireless network out to the, either the small business, the medium-sized business, or the industry that, that's going to consume that. We have recently joined the ORAN Alliance as well, so we're going to start um, trying to bring some of the cloud standards that Google has published, like Kubernetes and Service Mesh and all the infrastructure that is the Google way of delivering software and how we can contribute that more to the telco space and the ORAM consortium. And then we also announced something that is going to be, we feel, a build disruptive. KJ just talked about the hardware life cycle in a carrier. Um, Google is now building what's called the Google Distributed Cloud in several different forms, where we can sell leveraging our POPs of the largest global distributed network in the world, and in a carrier's location or an enterprise location, servers that can power a RAN, servers that can power a core. So that's what we call Google Distributed Cloud. And, um, we, you will see this mature. We have a fairly number, small number of both RAN and core pilots underway on that platform, but it's going to be a big thing coming in the coming years. So if, if I was to look at my conversations in, in carriers, they're really looking to adopt cloud native more effectively for the delivery, support, monitoring, and slicing of their networks. And so the first area about being able to accelerate the delivery of cloud native technologies. And I work very closely with the partners that are trying to become cloud native from a legacy perspective and also partners that started there. And there's a very different mindset in terms of how VRAN is being implemented in some of these different systems. Some of them are having to evolve legacy systems that are fairly monolithic build it into a new architecture, containerize some of the different pieces. Um, they look at the DU, the CU, the monitoring infrastructure that's required to really have what they had before, and it's a bit of a challenge. And cloud providers like Google are helping some of those uh, partners of ours through that process. TCO is of the number one thing around how do I lower the TCO of the infrastructure, that's the piece that we focus on. But as it was said earlier, it's also how do I drive revenue as a result of the same implementation. Going in with a message just around savings cost is not that effective with the carriers today. They need to see the innovation and they need to see how they can adopt and deliver on their network requirements. Next slide. 
So this is the journey that we frequently see inside of carriers for both their core and their RAN infrastructure. So if you think about running um, virtualized 5G core on VMware in a data center, that's the model on the left. A lot of carriers today are in the middle. They've started on that journey of looking at how I can deploy VRAN for a small portion of my network um, in a virtualized fashion on cloud. How do I automate that life cycle? How do I adopt the CI CD concepts of cloud native so I can be more effective about delivering both the network components and the applications that are gonna run that network? Where we want everybody to be is a mixture of using cloud native across VMs, across containers, across the whole life cycle of orchestrating and delivering applications and having that tied together with the underlying infrastructure for containers. And that layer in the middle has got a lot of standards evolution to go. We're looking at the KRM standard and working with some of the software providers and carriers on how does the configuration information get transferred from a service order management system down into what network functions are required to power a radio down into the containers and where they're gonna run and the redundancy in DR for powering that radio in the containers. So that whole life cycle has a lot of like hand coding in it that I think the standards over time will, will chase out. And we're hoping the ORAN world, KJ's nodding his head here. He knows some of the people that are tackling that with us now. They're ex coworkers of his. Um, there's a lot of work to do to, to really increase the agility and uh, smooth that whole life cycle of deployment and management. Next slide. I did wanna share some of the, the challenges that I see. Um, today, my day started in um, Israel. I went to Sweden. Um, we just announced something with Oridu. I had a conversation with them in the Middle East. Uh, then I came back to the US, talked to a carrier here. But on every call, there's this concept of monetization. And I don't, don't know about your business constituents or what Rakuten is hearing from them, but everyone wants to monetize this investment. And the agility to be able to slice and deploy segments of your network as the bands evolve, I think is gonna be critical. But nobody really knows how to do it today. We're being asked to really explain what are the key applications, what are the key industries where 5G is required how do I message that to the market and how do I message that into my financial backers within my carrier company so that I can pay for that type of innovation? So monetization is something that we get a lot of inquiries on. Legacy RAN for 4G, 3G and beyond is still taking up a lot of the RAN mind share within carriers. There's been a lot of political upheaval. There's equipment out there that are being changed out. We've tried to engage in the 5G, open RAN, VRAN conversations very aggressively. And up until the last three or four months, we were saying, please wait, please wait. We have a lot of work to do on our existing network to refactor componentry before we can really engage in the ORAN, open RAN conversation with you. I think next year, we're gonna have a lot more active conversations about building labs, about trialing, about building solutions with carriers that are way ahead of the game like AT&T, where we're solving a business problem and we're providing that whole stack to solve that business problem for, for the enterprise. Um, third bullet down, 5G core versus 5G VRAN and open RAN. A lot more activity I see as companies have made their selection of 5G componentry is happening now for core. If I was to look at the active projects that we have and the sales cycles that we're delivering on um, from a production delivery perspective. And so that's also in a different phase of evolution. And so cloud native for the core is also something we're working on. And I'm gonna skip probably to the last one, I talked about all the standards that we're involved with. And our goal next year is really to start to engage in active conversations about VRAN and Open RAN and Cloud RAN um, plans with carriers, 
help the ones that are brownfield struggling, but then also meet the needs of some of the greenfield operators where that's their plan out of the gate. And um, we're looking forward to the next year. So then we had a couple of questions for the, the panelists. We'll go through that pretty quickly here. So I'll throw this out to the team, but can you talk about your experience deploying 5G Cloud RAN and VRAN and what were the key benefits? Plus where were the, is there room for improvement? So Azita, you mind? Sure, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll uh, kick it off. <laughs> I'll kick it off. Uh, so yeah, so um, number one thing is the cost and the efficiency that uh, both in terms of CapEx and OpEx. So we talked about virtualizing all the network functions, right? But RAN is where you get the maximum benefit in terms of cost, because 70% of, roughly 70% of the cost, the, the capex of a network is in RAN. So if you're able to bring savings in RAN, uh, you know, that, that goes, that really moves the needle. So in terms of CapEx, you can think about you know, going from the monolithic um, proprietary hardware software, going to cloud native software running on top of COTS hardware that uh, you know, reduces the uh, CapEx dramatically. If you think about the cell sites, uh, instead of having this heavy footprint of a baseband in cabinets and all the extra hardware that you need to have at the cell site, and you have to weatherize it and, and maintain it and so forth. So reducing all of that, so you need a much smaller footprint. Um, so whether you're, you own the cell sites or you lease it, so that reduces the cost. Now, when it comes to um, OPEX, uh, again, uh, I mentioned we are adamant about <laughs> automation, right? If something has to be done twice, it has to be automated. And this uh, cloudification end-to-end uh, -end enables you to have that automation in, in the system. So that reduces the, your OPEX uh, dramatically. Um, so that's the TCO. For us, the CapEx reduction has been about 40%. Um, OPEX reduction has been about 30%. And the more we improve our automation and improve our AI and uh, ML algorithms, that the, that number goes higher. So now every operator's mileage may vary depending on how they uh, do this. This so uh, and what Don mentioned about these service, you know, adding revenue, new revenue, like how do um, uh, over the uh, t operators bring over the top services? You know, people operators always complain about oh I spend all this money bringing the 4G. Uh, infrastructure and uh, you know Uber and Lyft and all those guys got the value out of it, right? So um, for us, it's really really important because again, we come from the background of we have all these services. So in Japan, we already have over-the-top services running on this uh, cloud substrate that we offer. So cost savings, service agility that brings new revenue, security. Security is really important. People think about oh because it's open, then maybe it's less secure, but it's actually the reverse, right? Because it's open, you have more visibility to your network. Instead of having all these black boxes, uh, you know exactly where things are. You have more visibility. You can put more control points in your network. You can isolate things. Um, so, And then the whole resiliency and scalability and all the other good things that comes with the cloud um, in terms of the benefits. Yeah, so that was a pretty good list. Uh, I'll add one more to that, which is the uh, refactoring of the software stack itself, especially for um, RAN software vendors who've been in the business for a long time. They have uh, software stacks that are tailored to their classic RAN. Uh, VRAN is giving them an opportunity to refactor, base it on new open standards through uh, uh, forums such as ORAN. And we see an incredible opportunity there uh, because uh, honestly, a, a lot of the work that's going on there is about exposing up the control plane, being able to have applications that come in and customize the network to meet vertical applications' needs and really give applications uh, the network they need rather than forcing applications to um, you know, uh, customize themselves for whatever network they're on. So that's another benefit we see with VRAN. It's a once in a generation kind of uh, rebooting of the RAN stack that uh, brings great benefits with it. I'd say my only addition there is, is the agility factor in terms of 
this refactoring will enable people to do uh, much more agile type delivery of applications. Um, and that's all about how do I support more use cases on my network so that I can monetize those use cases. And we're a big proponent also of the CapEx model. Somebody shoot me. Um, OpEx model. So we're OpEx through and through. Uh, I will say some of those conversations are difficult when that's not the political process that's currently in the carrier's procurement life cycle. So trying to transition, that's probably on the challenge side, not the benefit side. Carriers can benefit from transitioning to an OpEx model because there are times when you don't have to buy a maximum capacity out of the box when you're only going to be using that, you're only going to get there five years in advance. So the OpEx model and the cloud native model allows you to get where you're going but only pay for what you use. Build on that, please, because we just uh, announced something called Simmer back in Mobile World Congress a couple of weeks ago. I think it, 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 it brings that point home. You know, generally speaking, we think about capex for all these um, uh, spending and, and, and telcos, but now we have this uh, this solution we call RAN as a service, where we have this this uh, box that's you know, it, you know one person can carry to the cell site. Um, it's uh, it's the latest and greatest. Uh, uh, Intel architecture inside that um, it could be a multi-purpose um, solution, meaning it can run a virtualized cell site router, uh, virtualized DU, um, floor. <laughs> front hall gateway, um, edge applications, uh, and and but the, the besides the innovation in the hardware and software, and it's it's on containerized Kubernetes. Um, Cloud, but besides the, uh, the the innovation in technology, there's also business uh, model innovation in the sense that we offer it as a um, as a service. In other words, you pay monthly service, and you don't have to worry about this. Uh, do I uh, refresh the hardware? Or do I refresh the the software? So it's all uh, done for you. So that's uh, that's great. Just another new thing. Well, for the sake of timing, why don't we jump to the last question? If there's any comments regarding scalability, either nationwide or globally, that you might have, so do you mind taking a turn each on that one? Do you have any uh, sure. Um, building a network is not for the faint of heart, <laughs> cloudified or not, right? Uh, so it's uh, you. You need to be really committed to it, right? You need to know that. Uh, you, you have a spectrum, you have uh, obligations to the government um, to, to use this, to, to do the coverage and all that. So, uh, so that's something that people have to realize. Now, uh, for example, somebody was, uh, I think it was you, Don, that was mentioning this rip and replace um, thing that's going in some of the regional carriers in the U.S. The point with 5G or any kind of new spectrum that you have is, is whatever technology you pick, it's going to be with you for at least another decade, mm -hmm. right? So uh, you might think that, oh, it, it, maybe it's not ready now, or maybe it's not. But if, it's, if you don't jump there now, you're going to be stuck with the legacy stuff for another decade. So which is it? Like, would you rather try and learn what's out there? And now we have proof points. We have us. We have others that are doing this um, that... that you know, try to learn from them, use their platforms or whatnot to, to jump into the what's now the latest rather than go back to the legacy and, and be stuck with it for a while. Maybe I'll, 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 I'll jump in a little bit on the challenges side, right? Because, uh, you know, scalability is a really important consideration. And I think for us, we start from the end customer, right? That's people who are using our network. At the end of the day, they don't really care about whether their network is virtualized or not. They care about the fact that they get good coverage, they get good speed, the connection doesn't drop, and so on. And so working back from that, we do um, sort of understand that all carriers have a spectrum position that they've deployed over the years. I think some folks are uh, newer, so they're, uh, you know, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's a little bit simpler. Some are older, some have uh, spectrum that they've deployed many years ago. And at the end of the day, our focus is always on identifying how is this overall experience going to be better for the end user, right? And I think some of the challenges to scalability come from that. It's you have to go in and find the right place to introduce this new technology. 
because it has to coexist with what's there in a way that doesn't create a disruption for the user. And I think some of the brownfield challenges you've heard uh, mentioned come from that. Uh, and I, I, it's, it's gonna take a little bit of time for the industry to, uh, for the operator community to figure out, and, and the answer is gonna be different for each operator. What works for them based on what they've already deployed, what spectrum they have, what new spectrum they're going to deploy. And so I think that will be uh, a key consideration going forward for all operators, I think, as they look to kind of scale this technology more broadly. I think of, of working for a company that has the world's largest software-defined network, we're trying to bring a lot of those technologies to carriers, and that's why we're doing things like Google Distributed Cloud, Edge, Hosted, because we see carriers wanting to scale their networks a little bit like the hyperscalers are doing and take advantage of maybe what's already there. So a, a lot of our approach is how do we augment first what you have with our global network, whether it's deploying RAN in a Google Pop in a location or an aggregation site, and you only have to finish the last 100 yards or the, the last half mile. But there are tons of scalability issues that carriers have solved for years with, with hardware solutions. And we are trying to make that a lot more easier for them to leverage the network that we've deployed on a global basis out of the box with the technologies like Kubernetes and all the cloud native capabilities that make that agility and that agile process capable and possible for carriers. Um, there's also, a, you know, on the challenge side, there's regulatory issues and there's a, a lack of skills to get there. And I think that's also something that the cloud providers are all trying to address, which is how do we train a next generation of engineers that can adopt these capabilities and make agile delivery of networks much more easier. Great. So just a quick reminder. So there's information how to uh, contact the group. So we meet on the second Tuesday of every month. Our next meeting will be the second Tuesday of December, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. on Eastern Time. Also, there's a documentation that can be found on the wiki link. So please take advantage of those. And just wanted to thank all the panelists, so Azita, KJ, and Don. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's any questions from the audience, please feel free. Thanks for the time. So I was attending the OCP. They're talking about 70% of the compute workload will be moved to the edge, right? And then uh, the 5G operator try to deploy your CU side, DU side. So my question is more like a real estate problem. <laughs> will you guys converge your site together? Like let's say if I build a uh, edge data center and I will invite AT&T or Rukatan, hey, uh, put your CU and DU here. Do you see that possibility coming? Or Actually, that's already taking place. AT&T is our largest customer for deploying Google's network across their properties, as well as all the carriers around the world. We call them POPs, regions. Um, there's 35,000 of them, actually 3,500 regions and 34,000 POPs that we are enabling and opening up for the deployment of the CU and the DU for edge applications. And so that's where we're headed, opening up our network that lives at carriers and lives in our data centers for those types of applications. Right, right, thank you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in our uh, deployment in, in Japan, you know, the, uh, as I mentioned, we have thousands of uh, far edge data centers, we call them GCs. Um, they are, you know, calling them a data center is, is like, it sounds like it is. It's, it's actually having a, a couple of racks in someone else's data center, right? So in, in our case, most of them are unmanned in NTT data centers. So um, as we uh, deploy elsewhere in the world, it'll be the similar things, right? So uh, we don't have to have our own data centers if, you know, of course you can, you, it's your prerogative as an operator. Maybe the central data centers you will own and some of the other ones uh, you will lease a space. But again, that automation, making sure that it's on man so you don't have to um, 
have people watching over it will make it much easier to work with others. Uh, I, I do want to add one more point that uh, VRAN is not just about the data centers. Yes, there will be data centers. And there are, as both Azita and um, Don have pointed out, there are central offices, there are other edge data centers already out there that are excellent areas where uh, RAN, VRAN hubs can grow. However, VRAN is also applicable for uh, what we call a DRAN configuration, where you are deploying servers at the, at the cell site in huts and uh, running workloads, compute workloads there. Right? So VRAN is equally ap applicable in both places. And um, uh, you know, the, the form factors may be slightly different, the density might be slightly different, but the technology is, we view it as you know, a continuum. The simmer that I was talking about, that, that sits at the cell site and it runs the DU in there. Oh, okay. We, we, are, one more. We, we are seeing some unique use cases where high volume data applications at the edge are where a lot of this architecture is going as well. If you think about a, you know, a, retail, a retail application where somebody's trying to try on clothes virtually or you're in a manufacturing plan or video-based use cases, we're doing things with both Intel, NVIDIA, and our own chips to be able to process that data as far out on the edge as we can. Mm -hmm. And so the deployment to the edge of the resources is important in those scenarios too. So that same level of push the capacity out so you can keep the processing out is where a lot of carriers are looking how to build their networks as well. No, thank you. Thank you for your input. Uh, any other questions? So again, online, so at the monitor. Great. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, really enjoyed that today. And again, thanks to the panelists for, for attending today. Thank you for having us.